Now I think about Logan nonstop. I just, I can't seem to get Logan out of my mind. Even when I have a break from whatever I'm doing, it's Logan pops in. It's just Logan. I don't, not necessarily think about anything, but just his name keeps popping in my mind all the time. give anything to change that day. And to, ha to have him here. You would have never thought that something that just seemed the right thing to do would be so impactful on people all over the world. Hockey in Canada would be, I would say it's probably more like football. Um, like, you know, everybody up here talks about how the NFL is, is a totally different world. And that's kind of hockey. If there's a hockey game on, it's on TV. Uh, I don't think you can go into too many houses in Canada where there's not a hockey game or hockey highlights or something like that going on. And if there's a hockey game being played, uh, like the major junior team, people are watching it. People know there's a game going on suits and ties and coveralls and it's all spectrums of, of the work world here where everybody's involved and everybody plays the game or wants their kid to play the game. This is Logan's room. Yeah, there's a, this might be his first pair, first or second pair. He started skating at four years old, four, four. So these could be Logan's first pair of skates. Yeah, they'll be. He played five sports growing up, like put the time in and actually got to be good in five sports, but he wanted to play hockey from the get-go. He lived and breathed hockey. His work ethic finally came out about 14 years old. He got cut from a hockey team, which he thought he should have made, and he didn't make it because he got cut. Sorry, son, you don't make it. So then he realized, I have to work harder. That working hard in hockey meant fitness, and it also meant skating. It meant shooting the puck, puck handling, positional play. Things that he was really passionate about, his work ethic was amazing. It felt like redemption or something, getting cut from AAA, and then you go and make the South teams. Nothing came easy to Logan. It's easy to be kind and friendly, but to get to where he had to get to, it wasn't like, oh, you're the best player every time. Oh, everybody loves you. Well, no, you have to work, and he had to figure that out. And so he killed penalties, and he'd block shots, and he'd defend his teammates. It didn't matter how big you are, he would go up against that person and do what had to be done to get the puck. Off the ice, he's the nicest guy in the world, and all he wanted to do was help people. But on the ice, that's kind of out the window, and he had a, a few good scraps. Kind of the role, if you're a big D-man, that's what you got to do, and uh, he, he did that well. I wouldn't have fought him. <laughs> You just play hockey, it feels like you're just on the pond or whatever, because you don't notice anything else but everybody on the ice. He was being scouted by a variety of junior hockey teams. You can't play out of Alberta till you're 18 years old. That's the rule in Hockey Canada. So you can only play in Alberta, and when you're 18, you go wherever the heck you want to go. Like 30 years ago, something like, I don't know, 25% of people in the NHL were from Saskatchewan. So Logan was pretty excited to play in Saskatchewan. Saskatchewan, I think, is, is one of the most competitive leagues in Canada. If you're going to play in the Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League, you would be aspiring to get an NCAA scholarship, play major junior hockey, or go to a Canadian university hockey. It's one of the smaller leagues, and there's no private ownership in Saskatchewan. It's, it's, uh, it's all community. Um, have you been to Humboldt? When you go to Humboldt, you will get there and you'll go, there's not a whole bunch here, but there's a big rink, a nice rink, and there's there's a junior hockey team. Saskatchewan is directly north of the northeast corner of Montana and North Dakota. And in their league, they go from four hours north to five hours south. So their league is literally spread 600 miles each direction. <laughs> 
but Humboldt is very central, so they don't have a lot of overnight trips. Humboldt's the best travel place. The Humboldt Broncos have been around for 47 years. This is their 48th year of operation. And hockey night in Humboldt is a big deal. It's, the city has 6,000 people, the EPA seats 1,700, and on any given Friday night game, there's 800 people there. That's like a seventh of the town just come to watch a hockey game. Saskatchewan doesn't have a professional team besides the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, so that's their team. You drive through Saskatchewan on a Friday, Saturday night, businesses are gonna be shut down because they're all at the junior hockey ring. It's a place to go and talk and complain and cheer and yell and scream, and if it's cold, it doesn't seem to matter. We've gone out there, it's minus 20, and there's still 800 people at the game. Sometimes there's a 1,000. Bronco jerseys, Bronco jackets, all the minor hockey teams are named the Broncos. Players from age 16 to 20, they're, they're the NHL in this town, and the kids look up to them like they are. I think the teams are really important to, to the towns, but vice versa, you know. Without community support, there'd be no team. Without billets, there'd be no team. They just kind of become like your second family, and then it's not really like you're living away from home. One, two, three, four, five, six. This is our seventh year billeting. Yeah. <laughs> How did Logan come to be your Bronco? <laughs> Well, thank goodness he got traded from Kindersley. <laughs> yeah. So this is my fortress. Yeah. Bed, desk, messiness. And then in here, I keep Logan's jersey. My dad asked him to sign it, and he's like, sure. So I think we're going to get it framed right away, too. And um, yeah, and I really, I really like it. I don't know. Billeting is we host a Bronco player in our home, becomes part of our family for as long as he's here playing hockey. You know, we learn to love him just like we love our own. The first year Logan showed up, his mustache was just like here, nothing here, couldn't grow it at all. Second year, he could grow up pretty decent, still terrible. And then, as in the pictures, his third year here is nice and full, thick. He kind of knew how to grow it then, and it looked pretty good. So I drew his little mustache. Pretty decent mustache. They were a steak and potato family, and they had lots of it, and he liked the pulses from day one, and they liked him. We were, we were brothers. Like, we'd always sit at the couches out in the living room. We'd debate over sports, our theories for the playoffs. Even in his third year, Logan spent a lot of time, you know, upstairs in our living room, whether we were watching a movie or playing poker with McLaren. <laughs> he taught McLaren how to play poker. Pick us up from school sometimes. If you need to help my parents out by, like, going to get something at the grocery store with us or taking us to hockey practice, whatever it was, he did. He liked driving his little red Volkswagen. He would go to family dinners, and when Logan was injured and or he was sick, they helped him out and took care of him, just like he was their kid. It was his family. Yeah. He spent a lot of time together, uh, yeah. a lot of time on the outdoor rink. Oh, yeah, he'd give him tips. He'd show out a body check in the, in the rink in the back. Usually when you walk out here, there would be like four feet of snow the one year. Me and Logan were out on the outdoor rink, and I was like, Logan, show me how to hit. So we were, there was a big snow bank right there. So I skated down, he did a hip check. I flipped right over him. My head went head first in the snow bank. They started laughing at me and I went inside because I was so cold. I came back out, then I was like, let's do hitting again. So he came down this board and I just lit him up right into the snow bank. Then we're both mad at each other. We walk inside, so. So definitely a good memory of Logan, for sure. He lived there for more in the last few years at the Paulson's house than at our house. Second weekend of September you start. Third weekend, yeah. Second or third weekend, and they play 58 games. And then, the, so by March, Logan's birthday's March 2nd, so somewhere around the first part of March, the season ends, and then it goes in the playoffs. So then playoffs are, you're in it till you stay, and once you lose, you're out. Pack up, you go home. 
You get a job, you go train. Rick Suggett, or his nickname is Sluggo, he was a rugby coach. Before he moved to Lethbridge, he was actually the U.S. Olympic coach for women's rugby. Sluggo was a nickname that Rick's dad gave him when he was a pretty young guy. It had to do with, you know, his feisty attitude. We'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Rick started working with Logan and his friends in April of 2016. Toby was Rick's manager with the U of L Pronghorns rugby team. And Logan and his friends, they were looking for someone to work with in the off season. And so I guess he just said to Toby, well, I'll do it. Rick goes, I'll train your son. I go, what do you mean you're gonna train my son? Don't worry, I'll train him. I need him and three other guys that can't be dickheads. So I told Logan that. So he got three other guys to play in the SCHL that all live around here in Lethbridge. And they're like, who's this guy? Logan, what'd you get us into here? What's going on? He was uh, quite interesting. He had this big, big personality. Like, he walks into the room and you know he's there. He loved to have a good time, loved to goof around, but you didn't want to let him down or waste his time when you're working out with him. You know, when he was coaching, he really just left it all on the field. Like, he is very boisterous and dynamic, and he thought outside the box quite a bit. We would always get up a little bit earlier than the kids in the morning, and he would get on his laptop and sit in, in the recliner and just be chuckling to himself. And I'd say, what are you, what are you laughing at over there? And he, he'd say, oh my gosh, you can see what I'm gonna make the boys do this week. I don't know that everyone was always as enthusiastic about, you know, the early morning sessions, but Logan was inspired to work hard. They all worked hard. He had very clear expectations of effort. He refused to be around people who weren't going to put any effort in. And that's why Logan and Sluggo really hit it off, because Logan was willing to put the hard work in, and Sluggo saw that in him and not just appreciated it, just really enjoyed being around Logan as well. Sluggo's impact was not just physical on Logan. It was really a true mentor to, to Logan. Before Rick passed away, I had assumed that he would outlive me, even though he was 13 years older than me. He was just a healthy, outgoing, always running around. Like, he wasn't the coach of practice that just yelled orders from the sidelines. He really got involved. He was driving our middle daughter to swim club. when it happened. He'd had a cerebral hemorrhage. One of Rick's colleagues at work, the spouse had just received a lung transplant. And a couple of weeks before Rick had passed away, we got into this conversation one morning with the kids too about organ donation. The end of the conversation sort of ended with him saying, yeah, you know what, I, I'd probably donate my organs. So a couple of weeks later when this had all happened and we got to Calgary and we met with a neurosurgeon and they said, there's no activity left in his brain. But he'd never gone into cardiac arrest. And so his heart never stopped beating. And when we were talking to the emergency doctor, I just said, well, what about organ donation? And then I sort of make jokes about how they peed in their scrubs a little because they got so excited. And so I said to the kids, your dad isn't going to live. Or, do you think, that if we can, do you think we should save someone else's life? Sunny, Logan likes sun. Came out just for you guys today. This is our backyard. This is Logan's chair, and that's my chair. 
Rick passed away on June 27th, summer of 2017. So sometime in August, we're sitting in the deck, Logan and I just hanging out, might have had a hot tub, might have been having a beer. And Logan all just out of the blue says, I want to be an organ donor. And I want to be an organ donor because of Rick. And I said, that's awesome. I said, nobody's going to want your organs and when you're 80, but you go ahead and sign up and become an organ. He says, I'm going to do that when I turn 21. Part of the joke with Logan was that when you're 21, you're legal anywhere. You can do anything in the world. So then as he got close to his, his 21st birthday, he's out with a friend and they're driving back and they stopped and they're talking in the car. And it came out that I'm going to be 21 on this day and I'm signing my, my donor card. So we were sitting in his red Volkswagen outside and we were just kind of talking about his trainer who had just passed away and how he gave the gift of life and saved five or six lives. So Logan's like, I'm, a, I'm an organ donor. I signed my card and I think it's the right thing to do. And I kind of said, isn't that kind of weird? Like kind of getting your organs taken out after you're passed away. He's like, well, if it could save six lives, then I'm going to do it. And he always had that mentality. Others before you. Rick was definitely a, a role model and a mentor for, for the four of us and, and Logan especially. You know, we thought the best way to, to honor him was to continue the training that he'd put in place for us. Logan kind of took the charge with that and kind of just, just led the group by example. They all went back and they're all the fittest guys in their team. And Logan, when he went back to the Humble, they're like, what did you do all summer? You are fast, you're fit, you're way strong. I noticed a huge difference when he walked in the door. He looked like a man. He was thick and he was ripped and in shape. He wanted to come back in his last year, make a difference. The vets coming back, I think, really felt that they had a legitimate shot to win the league and, and go far. These guys took it to that next level. They were going to do everything themselves individually to get to where they wanted to be. When Darcy took over in Humboldt, he, he had a, a clear objective. They were changing the culture in Humboldt. Sometimes it's a two, three year process and it takes time. And, and they were getting there. Now they had run into a really good team in Nippo. And so they're, they were behind in the series. And everybody has this belief that they were going to win that, that next game. You know, you hear the kids all the time saying that every one of them thought they were going to Nippon and then they were coming back to Humboldt right after that for the next game. with my two boys. I was in a hurry. I wanted to get back to Nippon because I was picking up my, my brother. And as I left Melfort, I, I went to Grunglid Way. I usually go that way all the time. I drive there like maybe a dozen times a month. When I came to the intersection, I had my hands on the wheel, my foot on the brakes. I usually just, you know, wait for traffic to, to pass. And I had seen the bus, Charlie Charter, it said. Then all of a sudden, it just happened so fast. It was just like slow motion after the impact. away so quickly. There was debris hitting us and I was running over things. I just couldn't believe what I saw. You know, I was 28 weeks pregnant and I was breathing hard. I was trying to scream, but I needed to stay, stay calm because I didn't want to scare my boys. I, I immediately asked them, don't look back. I seen a whole bunch of people carrying blankets and running to help. And the paramedics and police showed up fast. I started feeling my stomach go hard. I tried to 
be calm as much as I could. I didn't want to go in labor. One of them cops, I caught his attention and I told him, I think I need to go to the hospital, I said. He was pretty shaken up too, I, I know, I know what he saw. I couldn't stop crying and I was thinking about the parents there. Because I had just found out what was in that bus and there was hockey players. We were pulling up to the crash site and you can see there's vehicles all over and he's like, what's going on here? We get closer and like, holy crap, there's a there's some big cemetery that's flipped over and there's peat moss all over the place. Wow, something happened here. A little girl comes up and a young lady knocks on the window, tap, tap, tap. And she says, can you help me? She says, do you have blankets? The Humble Broncos bus was just in an accident and we need blankets. So I so you guys stay here, jumped out, grabbed blankets, and off I went to the crash site. There's people that had passed. They're just lying there, and they'd covered some bodies up. And, uh, and there's people volunteering. And one of the gentlemen had taken control. He goes, does anybody know how many people are on this bus? And I go, there's 30. And everything just stops. I was trying to identify faces. They all have blonde hair. They all have blood on their faces. There's boys just standing there crying. There's people all over. And I'm kind of looking for Logan. I want to, where's Logan in all this? Where's my son? Myself and a couple other people that were there dug into the bus and we're trying to get peat moss to hold the bus up to create a fulcrum to let it up to get more kids out because they're screaming, they need help. So then our RCMP officer comes up to me and says, you have to leave. I hear your son's here. So I walk away, go back to the vehicle, and Brittany did you find it? No. Well, then I grab more blankets, and I go back, because that's my ticket to get in, is my blankets. One of the dads said, they found Logan, he's over there, he's over there. By this time, they had a purse on a gurney. And so I went over to this gurney, I'm looking, well, it could be Logan, I don't know for sure, there's lots of blood, and so I don't know. So I turn the other way, and I'm just standing looking at the bus. And we're just standing there looking at the, 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 the tragedy. And then another RCMP officer came up to me and said, you have to leave. It's been explained to us that you are a father, you have to go. I was in the vehicle with McLaren and we were just sitting there and waiting and kept looking and we couldn't see anything because we were on the other side of the bus. McLaren and I really had no idea how how many people had already passed away or what had happened. And I just kept, every time Toby came back, you gotta go back and find, you gotta go find my baby. You gotta go back and find my baby. And yeah, he kept coming back. I can't find him. He's not, I don't know where he is. McLaren kept saying he's gonna be okay, he's gonna be okay. He's wearing Logan's hockey jersey that the family had purchased the year before. And could say, he'll be okay. I know he'll be okay. He'll be fine. We'll find him. We got to the hospital in Saskatoon. There's police all over the place, and the lights are flashing. People are directing where to go. And then they call you. Oh, the, the Boulay family. You get to check in. And then they come over. Can we see Logan? Can we see Logan? No. You have to come with us this way first. So we go there and... You get put in that room you see on the TV. We're in that room, and that's when they told us. His imaging was the first thing I met of Logan as I was preparing myself before I was able to actually receive him from the trauma team as they dropped him off. And it was a devastating series of scans. His brain injury was quite severe, um, extremely severe. They told us that Logan had a broken vertebrae and he'd probably be paralyzed from the waist down. And they had a massive brain bleed that had changed and the ranking system had gotten worse. 
and that it's irreparable brain damage. Like it was not going to get better. He was going to pass away. I'm sure for any family member who comes in and suddenly sees their previously vibrant, healthy, well, young person attached to life support, it's going to feel absolutely shocking. We asked, like, are you sure? Can you do anything? No. All right? Well, that's what we'd... You can yell and scream and demand more. We weren't... We cried our eyes out. And then that's when Bernie asked, can we donate his organs? The Boulet family had conversations that everyone, I wish, could have with their loved ones. Even as we were beginning to just explain to them the catastrophic injury that we predicted that Logan would never recover from, they brought up that he had spoken and had known someone who had been an organ donor and that on the back porch, he told them clearly what he wanted to have done. We weren't even at the part in our conversation where we typically would talk about the opportunity for donation, but they had in their hearts a clear vision of what Logan would have wanted. And in that moment of extreme grieving, they could speak for what he wanted. And then they let us go see Logan. He was beautiful. Logan was beautiful. We cleaned up his face. He had a bit of a lump here in his temple. He had a bruise on his one shoulder. And other than that, he had no outside damage whatsoever. He was beautiful. And about 11.45 the next morning, and Saturday morning is when they officially declared brain pass. But his heart beat on its own, and we were told more than once by the nurses and doctors that in a situation of an organ donation, that's the strongest heart they'd ever seen. Despite Logan's traumatic injury, Logan's heart didn't stop beating. It carried on. It had another purpose. Because they had to wait for everything to get in place for the surgery before they could recover the organs. We got 27 hours that we got to spend with him. We sang songs and we read stories to him, and we talked to him, and laughed, and held his hand. It was kind of like reliving things that we loved to do when they were little. Probably one of the best things I could do was just lay my head on Logan's chest and listen to his heartbeat, and it was strong, and you you could close your eyes and it wasn't, you weren't in a hospital. You're trying to do everything you want to do forever in those hours, because that's all the time you know you're gonna get, even though we were thankful for the time we got. The Boulay family sustained many of us in how they led through their grieving. They are people with clarity in moments of crisis and love deep enough to stand up when it was probably the most difficult thing for them to say. Watching them hold him and caress his hands and hearing the stories about his trips with his sister the pictures all around just showing that this family had so much love and they had so much to lose in that moment. We got to walk with him to surgery and just before they took him in, we got to say goodbye and give him a last hug and a kiss. We always talked about Logan battling through and working hard to, to get past obstacles. 
and I believe that I think he battled so that we could be there with him and for us to be able to say goodbye to him and to be with him. All six of his organs were donated. Heart, lungs, livers, kidney, pancreas, and his corneas. We were getting questions and there was false information. Is Logan still alive? I've heard you've donated this and that. Or that he passed away. Or he passed away. We just told Neil, Logan's godfather, just do something, send something out. And then that's where the Logan Bully effect started. After I posted that on Facebook, I did check you know, the status of that post and I started to notice that there were people that were not necessarily in my immediate circle that were replying back. You can see within hours, you know, we we're already, I think, up to a thousand. Twitter kind of got involved. Some news groups locally reported the right news and got quite a bit of, of traction as well. He was just 21 years old. Logan had signed his The final wish of Broncos record. defenseman Logan Boulay. He helped save the lives Phones of are ringing off the hook at the Saskatchewan Transplant Program. They've Since Sunday, the number of people signing up as donors in Alberta has actually doubled. I would hope that this spreads like wildfire and that the Saskatchewan has some of the worst organ donation rates in the country, about half the Canadian average. It's why the final wish of Logan Boulay means so much to so many. All of a sudden, messages came in from around North America. Like, my dad had a heart transplant. Thank you so much. Just the, the volume and the cross-section from around the world, people of all walks of lives, all ages. It's surreal, really, to see that number and to, to know the grand effect. In Canada, only five provinces have online registration, so they could actually keep track. Regular organ signups for Alberta were like 300 people a weekend. Well, that weekend they had like 3,000, and then every day it was like boom, 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 boom. So by the end of April, which is Organ Donor Month in Canada, whatever it would normally be, they attributed 95,000 extra registrations due to the Logan Boulay effect, which is like astronomical, because it's opt-in, not opt-out. That's people actually making decisions. And all of a sudden, out of the woodwork, there's hundreds of thousands of people, and not just in Saskatchewan or in Alberta, but when you're hearing Worldwide, then it was, obviously the impact was, was way bigger than we thought it would be. When you sit down and think about it, it's, it makes sense. Like if you can help somebody else, why wouldn't you? I, I wasn't an organ donor and I guess just, I never thought about it more than anything. And um, when it happened, it just again seemed like probably something I should have done a long time ago. After the vigil, they told us that you could go clean out their locker, so we went in there with Bernie's brother, Kevin, and Rico came in, and apparently the coach had said to them, you guys need to find someone that's important in your life. and Who you're playing for. Right, who you're playing for. And that's what we discovered under the shelf where they sat. He had uh, taped a picture of us, our family, and a picture of Rick Sugg at Sluggo, and then he wrote work hard between the two, which we thought was a defining moment of the organ donorship and why his comment to me in August that I'm going to donate my organs because Rick did, it just it really sunk in how much of an effect Rick had in his life. Like really, really sunk in. They were kind of kindred spirits. I think it started with a favor for Toby and it ended up being about a relationship between Rick and Logan. I feel like there's just ripples in a pond. In Canada, the donor family and the recipient are not allowed to meet currently, um, but they can share letters. The letters go through the donation center and are screened to make sure they're not revealing any information that might be identifying in any way. And so we have received two letters. The one man who got the lungs had said, I don't think I would have been alive to write this letter. Worst day of our life, but there's something cathartic about being able to help somebody else. And there's also a little bit of joy in the sadness in knowing that someone else lived and that part of your person helped. Help.
Logan has inspired over 100,000 people to sign their organ donor card. And it's still not enough, but it's a great place to start. I just think it's a miracle, but also a tragedy. So can, can you have a miracle and a tragedy at the same time? Yeah, apparently you can. You're watching. He's sad. Say hi. Hey. This crash changed my life. I I see things differently, you know. I see life differently. He's really smiley all the time, eh? Yeah, right there. Say hi. Hi. When I found out about Logan. I was just so inspired and it's beautiful to know that somebody is carrying his heart. Yes, this is Logan. Logan Humble Strong. I want her to play hockey and I want to tell her I named her Logan because Logan Boulay was was a beautiful person. <laughs> Logan always had the mentality, others before you. And that was his like drive and passion. So we caught him up every day. Knowing he could go to the rink, be with his team, help his teammates out when they need help. And that's just how he was. Last year I tried out for the BMAA team and I unfortunately didn't make it. So that night I was kind of like walking around the house, panicking and stressing. Logan stayed up with me. I found out I didn't make it. I was really sad. I came in here and cried actually. I went out and Logan just told me, hey buddy, I know how it feels. I've been cut before too. And he told me about it. He said next year you're gonna kick ass and you're gonna, you're gonna make the team. So these are the same stickers the Broncos wore last year. So I'm wearing number 27 right here for Logan. He was texting us and saying, I made the team. He's so jacked to tell us he made it. And he said, I remember last year being here with Logan and how it, it, him helping me through this night. I did make the team this year and I know he's really proud of me. You always say you want your son to look up to you as a parent, but they, uh, find other individuals to look up to. I think for McLaren to have that relationship with Logan and to look up to him the way that he does. <sighs> We're richer for it, so is McLaren. I couldn't ask for a more amazing young man for my son to look up to. I'm definitely gonna be an organ donor now because of Logan, for sure. Every day, I, at some point, just think that there are six families that are enjoying a life with a loved one, with the loss of Logan, and there's no greater love than that. He had to die for this to happen. But it makes me proud that Logan made that decision at a young age and the reasons why he did it. And then he actually then followed through and signed his donor card. And then he told someone in Humboldt and he told us in Leopard. That makes me feel proud that, that my son did that. I still want Logan back, but it makes me feel very proud of the decisions he made to put this process in place and to ultimately make six lives better. They might get married, they have their own children, so you're just really, it's generational.
decision Logan's made and any organ donor has made, any of them, doesn't matter if it's not just Logan Boulay, it changes lives.